Well, hello and welcome to the Widow's Oil. Today, I want to make a, a video to encourage fellow believers and also to warn you at the same time, because we are living in a time where there is so much false doctrine and false teaching. And I know how confusing it can feel and um, how easy it is to, to fall for these um, these evil schemes of Satan because you know Satan is is very subtle um, but there is one type of a deception that I very clearly uh, have seen and um, that I can perhaps show you from scripture where there is a warning against it and at the moment uh, it's becoming even worse uh, because of the things going on in the world. And so I want to show you that uh, one great deception. So before I um, start uh, to uh, discuss the matter with you, I want to read you a word of encouragement from Revelation 3 where our Lord Jesus Christ encourages us. Um, and he says that he has the key of David and he opens and doesn't, um, and no man can shut and shuts and no man opens. I've got here the 20th century King James Version because I just felt the new King James Version in this specific passage isn't um, very close to, to King James. And so I'm going to read that one. It says the Jesus who has the key of David and can open the heavens for us. Um, and no one can stop that. He says that. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the all the world, world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast um, that which you have, that no man take your crown. Okay, so those words are just as true for us today um, as it was when, when Jesus spoke these words for John to write down. Um, so I want to encourage you because then the Lord, he says to us that that. We must keep his word. If we keep his word and we do not deny his name, um, then he will keep us or guard us from temptation. It doesn't mean that we maybe may not, you know, fall at times, but if we hold fast to his word, he calls it the word of my patience. Um, so there are two aspects here. We must be patient. And we must hold on to Jesus Christ, to his name and his word. So hold on to the word. Um, and it says here also, hold fast to which you have. So something that is good to remember is hold to the things you have and you things you know. Don't do knee-jerk reactions when you hear something new you now totally throw everything you've ever known about your faith out because it says hold fast to what you have you see so satan uses also truth to deceive you and um you know when we hear the truth then we can sometimes uh, make knee-jerk reactions and totally go uh, in the opposite direction and throw away the good things and not just the false doctrine. So that is why the Lord says, be patient and hold 
fast and hold to the things you heard at first. And so that is what help, helps me too, is um, we must test all things. Don't just believe every spirit, it says, because many false spirits have gone out in the world. Now, that was written in John's time. Uh, how much more now? It's just multiplied so much. I'm sure all of you can um, that are truly seeking can attest to how much false things is going on. So be encouraged. He says he will guard us from the hour of temptation, but we need to hold fast to his word. Um, and his name, his name. So yeah, in 1 Kings 13, we read a very uh, interesting story that can help us show exactly what happens to us um, when we see in our churches false doctrine, something we've, you know, believed all our lives. And then the Lord, you know, because he's opened the heavens, he opens our eyes and now we see truth. And then it is a wonderful thing, but there is danger in, in that too. So we must be wary of that danger. So let us read there. It says um, in 1 Kings 13, and I'm reading in New King James, and behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to build, burn incense. Now this is about when, um, when Israel and Judah was torn in two after Solomon. So you had Jeroboam as king of the northern tribes and um, the son, uh, Solomon's son had the southern kingdom. And this Jeroboam, he built another altar because he was scared the people um, when they go to Judah to worship there, that they would turn against him. So he built this this altar, which was a false altar. So let us read here. Okay, so it says, let's start again. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he, he, being this man of God, cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burn, burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when the king Jer Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and he became as before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it was commanded me by the um, word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel and his sons came and told him all the works of 
what that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went, who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you. Neither can I eat um, bread, nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water there, nor return by the way which you came. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me, by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. And it says he was lying to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten bread and um, had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him. The prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a um, when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse, and there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now, when the old prophet had brought him back from the way he heard it, he said, um, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. Then the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas! Oh, and yeah, they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God was buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. After this event, Je Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made priests from every class of people for the high places, um, whoever wished he consecrated him and he became one of the priests of the high places and this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth okay so this is such an interesting story and it doesn't really make a lot of sense until um the Lord reveals it to you as with all or most things um so but there is a, a lovely um 
hidden message that that I saw in it. Now, this is what I see. So I'm not saying this is doctrine of the Bible. I'm merely sh sharing something that I saw in this um, and that has helped me tremendously to understand uh, what is I see happening um, regarding Christianity and in the world um, today. Now, as you see, I highlighted here this part, nor return by the way you came. So the Lord uh, gave this man of God, um, he told him to, to prophesy against this altar, this false altar, and he told him not to eat with uh, the king Jeroboam at this false altar or return by the way he came. So he said that, not eat bread, nor drink wine, or return by the same way you came. You'll see this is quite a significant uh, um, part here, nor return by the way you came. And then, yeah, we see also the same thing. He was also told you must not eat with this old prophet. So the old, there was this old prophet also, and he, but he was commanded also not to, to eat with him. It says, for I've been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. So it's again that same thing. Don't uh, eat and drink or even return by that way. Um, in uh, the New Testament, uh, we are told also, not to even eat with people when they have, um, in, when they have a false doctrine, um, and especially we should not spiritually, you know, eat of their spiritual food because we can be deceived. So let us look at this. What generally happens uh, when you you get born again is initially you don't see but it doesn't take long when the lord gives you a desire to read the bible that you read the bible and then you start to see but there is a big difference between what what is written and what is actually happening in your church so generally what happens is you will go um and maybe speak to the pastor and then you won't be received very well and then you will usually leave the church that's just normally what will happen or it could happen with some place on the internet where you've maybe um fellowship for long but then the you know you start to see this false doctrine so this to me represents this part where where this man of God actually spoke against this false altar, you see? Um, and he said this altar would be destroyed, which it was. Um, and then he refused to actually have eat and drink with them. In other words, this man of God did not want fellowship. This eat or drink represents fellowship. He left that fellowship. So he was obedient in that sense, not to stay there where the false doctrine was, not to try and reform it, because all that happens is you end up fighting and um, it, it, it doesn't help, you see. So we are not supposed to contend, you know, we're supposed to expose lies, but Jesus said if they do not receive you, you, you mustn't, you know, fight and want to to bring down fire from heaven upon them. He said, shake the, the dust off your feet and go on. So in this, this man of God was obedient. And normally, yeah, we can be obedient and leave. We, we, the Lord has opened the heavens through the internet because we can have access to just about anything. I mean, when I was young, everything was in a library. So where I grew up in South Africa, there was no way you would be able to get access to, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls or many writings and, and um, 
at they're at the tip of your fingers, you know, um, just the using an e sword for example, it just makes studying the scriptures so much easier. So, what generally happens then is there's a trap, and this is this old prophet. You see, there was this old prophet. So, there are many different traps that represent the old prophet that now says, well, come eat with me, you see, and he actually said to him, um, he said, an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you, you see, to your house, and that to me is important, bring him back with you, so um, and that was exactly what he was commanded not to do. Do not return by the same way. So generally what happens is this uh, represents um, falling back into the law, into keeping works. And a very practical one that I can tell you is falling into, for example, the Hebrew roots movement or some form of law keeping. There is so much. I'm not going to speak of everyone. If I speak of the most extreme one, then you could perhaps see those that are more subtle. So it sometimes helps to look at the extreme form um, first, rather than every single form of falling back and uh, going back to to the way by the way which you came so let us speak of something that we know very well is the returning to the hebrew roots movement it says yeah now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it that he was killed he said it is the man of god who was disobedient to the word of the lord therefore the lord has delivered him to the lion which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke him to him. Now, the Lord in the New Testament through Paul has given us so many warnings. Do not, um, do not return to works of the law. Um, and there is even an expression that 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 Paul uses uh, of a of. A, in the book Corinthians, where he says they were delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, you see, because there was a somebody that had um, committed sin. So, yeah, it says the Lord delivered him to the lion, which has killed him. So if we do not obey this great salvation that the Lord has given us through the Lord of, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we could fall back and be delivered to Satan, which then kills us again. Uh, it's a spiritual killing, but we could fall right back into the law. Um, let me show you, for example, Yah. Yah is a good example. Yah is what is called the Tree of Life Bible. And it's very common that these Bibles are now all over the show. This Bible, it says um, of it, let's quickly look there, it says, gain deeper insight into God's original purpose and meaning through this authentic Jewish translation. And then it says the Jewish order of the books of the Old Testament, the Jewish name of Messiah Yeshua, and usage of the Hebrew terms like Shalom and Shabbat. So this Bible is not going to use all the English. It's going to put uh, Hebrew terms. Um, and, and so this is what is called returning to the Hebrew roots because as it goes, they say, but we come from Hebrew roots. But that is a lie because the root that we must be in is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he's the root of Jesse. So we don't have Hebrew roots. The root is Messiah. And I also want to point out here yeah, this changing of the name to the Hebrew name. I just want to point out here, yeah, has not denied my name. 
That's interesting. What you need to make sure is that this Je Yeshua is not another Jesus because Paul warns us about another gospel and another Jesus. This name is being used a lot. And this Yeshua is uh, one of this Hebrew roots and this turning back to to the works of the law. So this is very typical. Um, the pastors are, are in the Hebrew roots movement. They call them rabbi, even though the Lord said not to call each other rabbi. And they will use, uh, you know, those prayer shawls and it, it can go even to putting uh, that kippah on the head. Um, so, that is not what we are called to do. Now, let me quickly show you something Yeah, Let's go to Galatians 3. And it's again there where Paul says foolish Galatians, because we sometimes act like foolish Galatians. So let's just look here. He says, yeah, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, just think of yourself. How did you come to faith? And how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive it when you heard the gospel preached, even in one of your false churches? Or did you go sit in a synagogue or maybe a Hebrew roots um, uh, a movement? And did you receive the Holy Spirit there? No. Uh, the Lord uh, maybe called you in your own home and it was through the hearing of the gospel and the mercy of the Father. Um, or, yeah, you could have heard uh, the gospel. You heard it through the gospel. You see, it was not by sitting in, in a, a, a Jewish synagogue and it was not by going to a messianic uh, a movement. Mostly people in the Messianic movement are, are leaving the church and going back there. So just think of how you received your faith and how you received the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says there. Did you do it? Did you receive it there where you are keeping Jewish feasts and using Jewish terms? Or was it just by the preaching of the gospel? That already is going to show you. You see, um, and yet yeah, in Galatians 2, we see yeah, um, in, the, in the New King James, it actually has a little heading which says no return to the law. Now, remember what we said yeah, all this time with this story of the man of God. Do not return by the same way you came. You see? No return to the law. Do not, you've come by that way, do, do not return to it. So, yeah, let us read that. This is the part where Paul actually confronts Peter about uh, something Peter did wrong. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the, the circumcision means what we call what we think of as the Jews, though it was sort of the, the Judahites, that would be a better term for them. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew, living the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. 
But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Okay, so I want to please speak comfort to you. I know how it feels. I have also been there. But if I see, if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? That means if you now um, try and follow Jesus, but you see all these errors um, of the others around you, does it mean there's something wrong with Christianity? Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Is Christianity in error? Certainly not. You see, so we are sinners and therefore there are many false doctrines and things. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the gospel. Um, and I know how confusing it is. But if you understand that, then you will see why this is important and why Paul rebuked Peter in front of all and said to him, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews. Now I'm using the term Gentiles and Jews because that's how people speak. But these terms can be confusing. But if you patiently persevere, you will understand eventually also regarding these terms. So I can say to, to these um, prophets who say to you, you must now use these Jewish uh translations and go to your Hebrew roots I can say to them why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews why are you compelling Christians to live like Jews so let us also remind ourselves of this that says for if I build again those things which I destroyed I make myself a transgressor so that is why the Lord said don't return by the way you came don't build up again that which Jesus Christ broke down Jesus broke down the middle wall of separation between what is called today a Jew and a Gentile there's no more of that in Christ we are one you see but it is very difficult to let go of your traditions. It takes time. Think of yourself even that you may grew up in some denomination and how difficult it was to actually maybe leave your denomination uh, just to follow Jesus. So it is that same concept. But Jesus promised if we leave lands and mothers and fathers and, and all those traditions that we have, he is going to give us so much more. And that is true. He really, really does. But then you must go through this patient endurance process. Now, I want to also show you here where Paul warns us against these false apostles. Be careful of the old prophet. I'm calling all these false workers the old prophet, the one that is going to try and take you back to the law in some subtle way. You see, even the Roman Catholic Church, they took people to works. So that is uh, one place where we clearly see that. But most Christians have, have overcome that. Um, but this other new one that's coming now, this Hebrew roots, that can catch us now. Now let's read there what Paul says about, about this. He says, says about this, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, 
transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So Satan is a chameleon, and he will appear in a way which works. You see, because he's a deceiver, and a deceiver must make himself look like the real thing. So this is going to happen all the time. Satan appears to people in, in a way that he can deceive them. Um, and so at the moment, there is this, this Jewish Jesus that's being set up. It's just another Jesus. So, so remember that. Also remember what Peter told us. He said, yeah. And Peter should know because he fell Sometimes, look, he fell here yeah, in Galatians 2. We read of a time where he where he actually did wrong. And then we all know the, the part where Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan, because you mind the things of men and not of God, you see. So Peter knows how it feels to fall. But Jesus didn't condemn Peter. He restored Peter. So be uh, encouraged if you if you fall as long as you keep guarding the Lord's if you have respect for his word he is going to show you and the other thing is be humble you see G uh, yeah, yeah he also Peter says uh, um, he says be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but give grace to the humble so one of the things is to to actually be humble um and along with your patience god is going to care for you and and don't worry it says cast all your cares upon him now jesus told us not to worry what shall we eat and what shall we drink because god is totally able to to care for us and would he not much more give us our spiritual food and spiritual drink and spiritual clothing if we ask him that? So it says there, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You see, he devoured the, the man of God. Resist him, steadfast in the faith steadfast in the faith so keep to your faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen so if I can encourage you, there are so many believers going through the same thing now. Look what he says, knowing that the same suffering is experienced by your brotherhood. Right now, there are brothers and sisters all over in the world who are trying to figure out the, the truth um, because there is so much lying going on. Um, so, yes, Satan... Satan is there, he is seeking whom he may devour, but remain steadfast in your faith and remember how the others are also struggling. And let us try and have some mercy with each other, you know. Um, I know that if I have a revelation I and I understand something, then I actually can sometimes find myself frustrated or even irritated by brothers and sisters who are still in the place I was but that is so wrong because it's we are like a child who children will be very uh, um, if a child for example is about 10 years old they'll be very impatient with a little child they forget that they were like a little child they feel so proud of their uh, you know that they've grown and, and they look actually look down on babies and say, you're a baby, you know. So we should not be like that. 
Um, we must help each other um, and, and we mustn't be proud. So he says there we're going to be established. He, he is going to make us perfect. He is good. Perfect means mature, mature in the faith. It doesn't mean perfect here on earth. It's it just perfect just means complete, you see, and established and strengthened and settled. So this yeah in Ephesians 4 actually really um, goes along with with that. Let's quickly read there. Um, so yeah, Paul tells us that the the Lord gave gifts to the church, the fivefold ministry, um, to to equip them and to help us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man. You see there again, a mature man. So we mustn't be children anymore. We must be a mature believer, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And then it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. So yeah, it is speaking of the church growing up, that we are no longer tossed about by by the wind. Think of, of that parable of Jesus where, where the disciples were so scared because there was a storm and Jesus made the storm calm. So spiritually, we are in the spiritual storm with all these doctrines tossing us to, to and fro. But yeah, yeah, Peter says he is going to... Um, after we've suffered a little while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. That's making the all these uh, uh, these storms, these doctrinal storms, they will end, and the truth will become apparent as you mature. So, yeah, it speaks that we grow up and not be like children anymore, but that we are established in the faith, and that is the word of comfort that I want to speak to you is that this um, terrible tossing and, and sifting that is happening with all these false doctrines and things, if we hold on to the Lord, he has promised that not one grain of us will fall to the ground and um, he will help us to grow up. But we must speak the truth in love. So it's two things, truth and in love. So speak the truth, yes, but do it in, in love. Don't, let's not bite and devour each other. But on the other hand, let's not so focus on love that we do not speak the truth again and just be quiet about people's errors. So let us speak the truth in love, and do not fall back to this old prophet um, that tells you to return to where you came. Remember what Jesus said. He said regarding the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember Lot's wife. Do not look back to that which is done with.